Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Phoenix, Arizona, it's time for Phoenix Business Radio, spotlighting the city's best businesses and the people who lead them. Hi there. Welcome to the podcast. We're so excited to have you on for another episode of STEM Unplugged. I'm Kelly Green, the Chief Operations Officer at SciTech Institute, a collaborative nonprofit organization making STEM connections in Arizona and beyond. In this episode of STEM Unplugged, we will be exploring STEM over the summer. Our guests are Kelly Ferguson, Education Coordinator at Lowell Observatory, Tom Fraker, CEO of Pathways to Learning, and Elise Oh, I didn't ask you how to say it, Elise. I'm going to have to have you help me. How do you say your last name, Elise? Corcoran. Uh-huh. I would have probably totally butchered that. She is the director of STEM outreach at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. So I want to say a big thank you to all of you for joining us for STEM Unplugged. So Thanks let's for having us. Yeah, excited. So let's get right to the reason why, you know, Claire, our new team member at SciTech Institute, invited you to come to the table, literally, figuratively, since we're a little bit socially distant, you're all up north. But we really want to connect to what's happening this summer. It is really actually time to unplug, move away from those computers, and experience hands-on STEM. But are we ready? And is it safe? But what are each of your organizations doing? So let's start with Kelly. I know the mission of the Lowell Observatory is to pursue the study of astronomy, conduct research, and maintain education programs for Arizona. But what's unique about Lowell's teaching methodologies? I've actually read about thermodynamics for preschoolers. Tell us more. I'm really glad you brought up thermodynamics for preschoolers. It is my favorite subject to teach. Um, It's actually this month, May is our thermodynamics, and um, the concept is nothing is too big or too complex to teach children. Um, They're natural scientists. That's our our goal is everyone naturally wants to learn. So uh, um, we give them the tools and and they run with it. And uh, with the thermodynamics for preschoolers, um, it's just understanding how, you know, heat transfer works, basically. So we make color changing slime and we make our own thermometers. And, and it's just getting that step into uh, into science, into technology, engineering, mathematics. So um, I know the kids really enjoy it. Oh, you bring up slime. It's like a favorite. When I was a oh. when I was a middle oh, school math teacher, I don't know how slime always ended up in my classroom, but the sixth graders, you know, I can only imagine preschool. But thank oh, you. Yeah, so <laughs> thank you so much, <laughs> Kelly. I'm excited to have you here. We also have Tom on the line with us. Thanks for joining. Can you tell Welcome. us a little bit about pathways to learning and how building a STEM identity is so important for all learners? Yeah, I think it's uh, important. And unfortunately, in most camp settings, uh, we don't have kids long enough to really move the needle on education in STEM. So what we try to do, and I'm sure what Emory Riddle and NAU does, is try to give them a one of those moments in their life where they might have said, aha, I kind of know what STEM is. Uh, I kind of would like to do something like that. And so it's right you know, lighting that spark and then watching them kind of explore. And I love the scientific term that you use, doing the stuff. (laughs) And the stuff is really important because they don't know it probably by another term other than stuff. Absolutely. And so um, we just try to give them stuff and things that they can grow and identify with STEM not being this uh, topic that is intimidating and only smart people can learn it and do it. That's a great point. I think that's, you know, part of why we enjoy working with all three of you is that, you know, SciTech Institute is really trying to advocate for all learners, zero to 103. You know, if you're interested, let us show you something cool. And, oh, you thought it was cool? Let's show you a little bit more. (laughs) So thanks for being here tonight, Tom. Um, What about you, Elise? We're excited you could join from Embry-Riddle. And here, wait, actually, I'm going to pose a tough question. What do you think the greatest need for K-12 students right now? And how do you think our STEM outreach programs all together could meet this need? Absolutely. Well, I would be remiss if I didn't address the break that all students have had over the COVID-19 school closures. And so I think when students are coming back into the classroom, a lot of teachers, maybe myself included in the past, would think, oh, you know, we have to hit the ground running. We have to worry about these standards and make sure we're really hitting the standards. We don't have time for the 
extra stuff, quote unquote, which STEM outreach teachers might lump that into the extra stuff. Again, stuff, big scientific word. The big stuff. <laughs> but, <laughs> the fun uh, stuff. <laughs> the but slime. I would really <laughs> counter that argument and, and say that STEM outreach, whether it's a summer program or whether it's a push-in program during the regular school year, or whether it's a field trip when teachers and students are able to do that again, that STEM outreach is it provides a way, uh, a modality for students to engage with these more complex STEM topics, whether it's technology or engineering or math. And to build off what Tom was saying, you know, it gives them an opportunity to identify themselves as a scientist, to feel successful, engaging with more complex activities in this hands-on way where they can really relate with it. And it makes sense to their own life because Uh, Maybe it has a cool end result or uh, it does something, you know, it it creates a change. The greatest need I think K-12 students have right now is to really just jump back in there, start learning again in ways that make sense for the students so that they can really engage with the material and um, get, get their feet wet again, get experimenting and start having fun again in an educational setting. Yeah, I agree. What about you, Kelly, over at Lowell? Do you have any exciting things planned for this summer that you really want to, you know, highlight, either plugged in or unplugged? (laughs) We sure do. We have lots of stuff and we also have lots of things uh, planned for this summer. (laughs) It's my new favorite. I'm going to stuff and things. So this summer we're um, working with children age or um, grades K through nine and 10. And uh, um, each grade will be learning something a little bit different. So our youngest kids will be learning about the solar system. And of course, we're at Lowell Observatory. So what better place to learn about the, the universe? Right. I think um, the, Earth is right behind you. I can see oh, it on and your then, screen. Yeah, our sun is right there <laughs> and then the moon. Yeah. Got it all. <laughs> um, so, yeah, this is actually one of the things we'd probably use. And, and you let the kids um, and uh, uh, um, encourage their divergent thinking. So uh, um, the next age group, we have the Milky Way. Um, and we're going to learn about galaxies and our kids favorite topic, hands down, no questions asked, black holes. And we have a whole lesson dedicated to that because even though we have 45 minutes uh, for, you know, quote, lessons, that black holes lessons always, always, always goes extra long because it's just a really fascinating subject. And then as we get older, um, we do life on other worlds. So our final project will be sending a message out into space using a radio transmitter. And then our oldest kids um, will actually become um, junior scientists, or excuse me, junior astronomers, amateur astronomers. Um, we teach them how to operate telescopes, how to, how um, adults, grownups, whatever, do research, and um, kind of get them in the in the mood for for science. and And that's where we see uh, um, a lot of our love really come out is our middle school students who get to do that, uh, um, get to operate telescopes, get to tell stories about the sky. So um, that's what makes our camp so unique. I think it's really interesting that you talk about allowing them to interact with the telescopes, right? Or play with things, you know, actually, you know, learning how to respect equipment that real scientists use is probably one of the best things that teachers can do for students is put it in front of them and say, look, this is important. This is the real tool and let's explore, but be safe and cautious. But Tom, I think that kind of, you know, delves into your camp setting as well is that they're doing the real science. They're dipping those, you know, items in the water at the lake and really experiencing it. But what what's going on with um, Pathways to Learning this summer? Yeah, so we haven't turned the corner <clears throat> relative to getting kids up to camps yet. Um, it's still the fear of COVID. Yeah. Um, we do have a couple of camps that center around that, but what we've done is done a pivot last year actually and took everything that we were doing at the camp over the last eight years to thousands of kids and we packaged it. So we repackaged it and we put all the modules, five of them in particular around solar and water and, and so on. And it's called STEM in a Backpack. So we created a backpack, we put the modules, the the curriculum card, and then things for them, the stuff again. Yeah, I was going to say that the they stuff. could do and stuff explore. In <laughs> and we are now um, having those be sold to school. So we sold roughly 4,000 of them. And what I find interesting, we needed a second 
product iteration of that, and we created Ag in a Bag. And so now they're doing <laughs> bee pollination and composting, which is, again, that is really stuff. And, and they're learning by that. And so we're delivering that now to schools for their summer programs. And we have a big uh, cargo van that looks like a log cabin on one side, and it's a desert landscape on the other side. And in the inside, it looks like a laboratory. <clears throat> and now that's being combined with the backpacks, either egg in a bag or steam in a backpack, and we're delivering it to school. So we're actually kicking that off next Wednesday, and we're driving down to the other end of the state, down to Tubac, wow. to a Montessori school, and we're delivering that those backpacks and those things out of the mobile STEM discovery lab to them. So our summer program is actually more in the city than it is at the camps, just because we're not over parents and, and schools, certainly jumping in the camps because of COVID. We feel that it'll all come back in the fall, but not right now. Yeah, that makes sense. I think the coolest part about the Steve in a backpack and the egg in a bag is is really hands-on, right? Like yep. I, I think the, you know, engaging learners, especially kinesthetic learners who want to touch it, feel it, experience it, you know, kind of goes back to the slime that Kelly was talking about. Why is that so important, Tom? What do you really see when you interact with educators and students that actually get to put their fingers in the stuff? <laughs> So particularly the slime or just in general sense? Well, you know, you talked about ag in a bag, right? How many of you actually dug in the dirt? I grew up in, you know, upstate New York. When we dig yeah. in the dirt, we would find worms. You don't really find a lot of worms here in Arizona. Oh. It's not the same. <laughs> There's a couple of side benefits that I find interesting about looking through a telescope or doing any of this stuff. It is really therapeutic. I mean, we are talking about STEM and we're talking about pathways and we're talking about having them create interest in identity. But I think in order for them to get into that mindset, there has to be a relaxation, a therapeutic, a, a calmness to something that in their classroom, they would probably you know, stand away, not answer, not raise their hand. And so I think the settings that we're all in, because we're in Prescott and NAU, and now we're on the road with this backpack in the Mobile STEM Discovery Lab, it's just an environment where therapeutically, I think they feel better about being learners and they feel better about taking a chance to learn something that they wouldn't have raised their hand in the classroom. Kelly, you kind of, or actually, no, I think it was Elise who alluded to that a little bit in the beginning. Like when we go back to class, how much is it about that standard or is it more about the whole learning and the engagement and understanding of a concept? What are your thoughts? Ooh, Elise or me? Elise, yeah. She alluded oh. to how do we, do we have to worry about all of the specific standards or can we really, you know, wrap it up into maybe themed units or project-based learning? Absolutely. Well, thanks for um, tagging over to me here. And I would first want to start off kind of bouncing off what Tom said by saying, I think it's so important to acknowledge that whole learner and that Participating in the STEM fields for some students, um, and looking back on myself as a girl, middle school girl, high school girl, I would have put myself in this camp of being really self-conscious about engaging with it, not wanting to take a risk, not wanting to be wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, even though I was a successful student, I was always worried about getting the A or making the grade. And I really saw that as a teacher in my sixth grade classroom. I would have bright kids who would come up and instead of being willing to take a chance or be creative or think outside the box, they would just be asking me, oh, well, what grade will I get on this? Or will I get the point for this? And I think really to just engage students on that deeper level um, in a project-based style, in an interactive learning environment, hands-on, that they're going to engage at such a deeper level and walk away with so many more of those standards achieved, the important state standards, when we allow students that space to make a mistake, to you know, ha take the risk. And I really identify with that and resonated with that when Tom was saying that STEM can be therapeutic if we bring students to that relaxed level where 
they know in the summer program or they know in the STEM outreach program that there's no real sense of failure. They can just try it out. They can try it on. And in that, there's a lot of room for success, taking away those measurements. I agree. Yeah, (laughs) definitely. And just to add on to that, Elise, that's one of the most important things I think that we hit on as soon as our kids come to camp, as soon as they roll in the door, we say, yeah, we're learning, but this is not school. This is not school. We get to yell in our classroom. We get to run in our classroom. And most importantly, we don't have tests and quizzes. It's all, it's all natural. It all comes naturally. And I think that takes a bunch of pressure off of doing something that's, that's so exciting. Yeah. And I think again, back to it's a real telescope. I'm looking at the real stars and, you know, I'm at this really cool place that doesn't look like my classroom, especially this year, right? Students that not only did they go back to the classroom, but it was back to straight rows. Now you're specifically all facing the front. You're not working in groups where we had really accomplished quite a bit in many schools in Arizona where we were doing, like I mentioned, I used to teach sixth grade math. There was collaborative projects. Students were sitting in groups. They were, um, you know, discussing ways to do algebra with manipulatives. Rather now they're, you know, potentially having a device in front of them in the classroom while also watching the teacher um, instruct you know, both digitally and in person. Completely different shift. Yeah. Well, first off, I can't imagine you teaching sixth grade math. Um, (laughs) Why? I was a great teacher. (laughs) I think you have uh, more excitement. (laughs) (laughs) That's why I was a great teacher for math. I had to make it fun. No, 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 no. I'm sure you were, but I just can't imagine. (laughs) I'll send you some pictures. I I approve. I did want to raise one thing. So um, we have been teaching through an instructional design that we created um, through a consultant. And we use that. We light the spark, create the experience do the identity and how does it relate to the real world. And about six months ago, we were introduced to a a professor at ASU, Steve Zeicher, and we partnered with him and we came up with a teaching framework called Green Studio. And it's interesting because conceptually it ties everything together. And it's based on the fact that kids learn better in a green space, backyard, park, in Flagstaff, in the mountains, and a lot of this green space. But in order to do that, we first have to be and have them uh, identify with their senses, touch, feel, smell, sight. And that does relax you and that does uh, cause you to want to explore. And then they explore. But the last thing that I would also challenge us all to do is how do we continue that? Once they start a pathway, how do we build where they um, identify with something and then they um, amplify that. And so we're trying to, once they amplify their interest and identify with it, how do they connect to a hydrologist if it's around water? How do they connect to an um, astrophysicist if it's around, it's around space? So I think we're all doing the same thing. And I, we've just brought it down to this green studio teaching framework that we're introducing to all the outdoor education STEM that we're teaching. I think that's a great point. And that's definitely the the benefit of being connected with SciTech Institute. And then, of course, the Arizona Technology Council, Arizona Commerce Authority, all of the businesses here in Arizona that want to prepare our future workforce now. And so they want you to talk to their engineers. They want you to reach out and talk to, you know, the hydrologists. They, they're they interested in con- getting the students connected, but also the adults, right? If you think about, you know, some of our adult learners that, you know, maybe they're in their, you know, 18 to 24, still haven't really decided what they want to do. But even, you know, people in my age, we won't say out loud, but, you know, there's there's some people that might want to experience something new. And STEM is a great pathway here in Arizona. We're growing rapidly and there's lots of opportunities. So that's a great point, Tom. If they want to meet that hydrologist, let's get them, you know, now we can get them on a Zoom call much easier than <laughs> driving them around town. But the, those companies are there. And I think that's the coolest part about getting to meet Elise, right? In connecting with Embry Riddle up in Prescott, the idea of like, wow, we have students that are graduating and they're excited to go there. They've already signed up. They're headed to Embry Riddle. Or when students go to Lowell, they're actually talking to, you know, 
real scientist who looks at the stars, right? Mm-hmm. Astronomers, astrologists, maybe an astrophysicist. Uh, I think there's that's all possible, yeah. And you have those at your site, right, Kelly? And they want to talk to anybody who wants to listen. I've mm-hmm. I've learned researchers want to share. <laughs> they need to, they need to tell you what they what they know. That's our astronomers for you. We have amazing astronomers on staff. Um, uh, we also have some engineers, um, and then we do also work with Gore and have some of their engineers come through. So yeah, we have people who are in the field come in uh, and come and and teach. We also have amateur astronomers come through who are like, one of them was a high school biology teacher and he just did astronomy for fun. So he's like, you can, you can still do astronomy and then do also whatever you want. Like astronomy, does, it can be a career. It doesn't have to be a career, but I did biology. And then I was like, okay, I'm done with that retired. I'm going to, I'm going to play mingle and, and dabble in the stars a little bit. So it, I love when, when our amateur astronomers come up and visit our kids, cause they get to see, well, okay, even if I don't make it a career, I can still make it a huge part of my life. I think that was the coolest part about the Arizona SciTech Festival this year was this opportunity for me. Um, you know, I've only been with SciTech now this three and a half years, but really getting to connect with all of the collaborators and identify who you know, right? You mentioned the amateur astronomers. Tucson has an entire group, and now they have the Black Star Chikawa site. I think it's how you say it, Chikawa. But they have these locations. Chiricawa. Chiricawa, that's what it's called, see? Um, but to actually meet up and, hey, let's have an astronomy night with a bunch of amateurs that I would say they're pro compared to me because these oh, ginormous yeah. telescopes, and they're so incredible that, you know, you're right. It doesn't have to be the paying job, but it could be. Who knows, right? Absolutely. And if not, it's just something for fun. It, you can do it for fun as a career. You can do it for fun as a hobby. That's that's why I like it. I loved yeah, Emory Riddle, too. What? They made straw rockets with us during festival. And we were joking about, okay, what do you guys do for real? <laughs> but they, we had like a straw rocket pro give us a presentation for, during festival. But, <laughs> I love, love that. But Kelly, I think the other important part is even if you're doing this as a hobby, it's all about critical thinking. Absolutely. And my guess is, and this is STEM is obviously new to me and it wasn't around when I went to school or anything, but the reality of it is if you're in business doing something, I'm sure if you do STEM and you're around that critical thinking, that is a great application to really do any business, to be an entrepreneur, be an artist, or whatever it might be. And I think even if kids don't go into it as an occupation, it can be something that they go into as a hobby. You know, it's really funny you say STEM wasn't around when you were younger. <laughs> be careful. I know. <laughs> But when we think about that, that's exactly my point about engaging, you know, the not just the K-12 sector is really identifying and helping different generations identify with STEM because it is here. And that's what their children or their grandchildren, the neighbors, children, right, the community is talking about. And when we were, who was I talking to the other day? And they're like, well, we're not really STEM professionals. Uh, actually, you are. You do like all of the water systems for the entire city of wherever we were talking to. That's STEM. And I think that, you know, identifying, Yeah, you know, I was a farm kid. So sitting cross-legged in the kitchen, milking, you know, giving a, a baby cow a, a milk bottle so they didn't starve to death. Well, that's STEM, right? You have to understand that there's there's pathways or entry points for a variety of different opportunities. But I think that's kind of why we brought you all here together today is really to focus on what are you do what are you going to do this summer? What do your plans look like, you know, in the upcoming year as we start to potentially transition right back, <laughs> Tom, potentially getting up there to camps and visiting locations. What are what are some of your goals? Let's start with Kelly. What are some of the goals for Lowell over the next year as we hopefully start to I don't know if we get back to normal ever, but it's a it's a new situation. Oh yeah, you said it, and and we're slowly um, getting back to quote like you said normal. We're not just a, a camp facility. We're we've uh, we're a research facility. Lowell Observatory has been around for over 125 years. Our founder Percival Lowell, in his mission statement, uh, uh, basically said that he wants this observatory to be here to conduct current ongoing research 
but also to engage the public and to teach the public. And, you know, I took that as in kids, meet me, I'm going to engage the kids, but our, our campus, the Lowell Observatory campus up at in Flagstaff um, has tours. Well, uh, we did before COVID have tours that, you know, goes through our history and, and we educate people of all ages, zero to 103, like you said. And uh, um, that's, I think that's what makes it super unique here. Uh, um and I lost my train of thought, so come back to <laughs> it's me. okay. I, that's why we're all here. It's a, it's a team Thank effort. But what about you, Tom? What are some of your goals for you know pathways to learning? I know you're engaging with our chief science officers. Our goal is to collaborate a little bit more. But what are some of the things you hope for your two campsites and future connections? Well, somebody already kind of mentioned this. Uh, we have a couple of T-shirts, and they have pretty profound statements on them. One of them is uh, "May the forest be with you." And so we're really trying to create <clears throat> the forest to be with kids, be that green space. And the other one is uh, no box required, think outside. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and I think in both of those cases, what we're really trying to do is to expose as many kids to, we don't even call them camps, actually. We call them outdoor learning platforms. And so all these tools, these applied learning tools, we have the mobile STEM, the backpacks, uh, we're trying to put them into a pathways to progressive learning. So back to what we said before, it's great to go to an observatory, but we're trying to give them a pattern or a reinforcement of doing one thing and then doing it in a different environment and then doing it in a camp setting. And, and I, so that's what we're trying to do. The other thing which is interesting is we're trying to bring STEM into agriculture and into sustainability. And so the one camp ranch is in Mayer, which is on the road to Prescott and on the road to uh, Flagstaff. It's uh, 5,000 acres, and we're creating a learning platform around uh, the environment and sustainability because STEM is alive in the ground, and it's alive in the sun that affects crops and regenerative farming and all those things. And so we're those in the, the climate crisis is around all of us. And that's actually going to be part of our program. So we're really, we're sticking with STEM, but we're kind of diluting STEM a little bit and putting it in other learning platforms and other things that are STEM, but they don't really know it when they're looking and they're feeling and having their hands in dirt and growing a crop or seeing the solar or the water impact. Uh, agriculture. I think it's really nice to think about trying it in one location, right? Learning it and then doing it in a different location and then in a new right. setting. I think that's important for, you know, gradual acceptance of any concept of, oh, okay, so I, I learned about it or I read it here. And then I, oh, I actually made a plant. Well, not me. I kill all plants, unfortunately. So maybe I need some support there. But, you know, planting a plant, I remember students in second grade saving their little milk cartons from the classroom and planting their seed and drawing the pictures. Well, I did it with my sixth grade math students to talk about measurement. And they were thrilled. I could not keep the potting soil. Like they would bring three to 10 little milk cartons back of, can I plant another bean sprout? Like, Oh, my goodness. But anyway, I think that's a really good point is that allowing that opportunity to do it in a safe space. And then potentially we could get these students to do community gardens and a, additional community impact projects. So I think that's great, Tom. What about what about you, Elise? What are your what are your, some of your goals at Embry-Riddle? Absolutely. Well, right now we're still have a model that's a lot like Tom's. We're passing out at the public library in a limited capacity what we call STEM kits. They're little experiment kits. They have directions for how to create, um, like right now, it is slingshot airplanes, as you alluded to before. Ah, I knew it. But then uh, it also has directions there on the scientific method, and it has additional supplies where students or participants, because the STEM kits is really for all ages, zero to 103, it has enough for students uh, to experiment with their own wing design. So that's how we're continuing with outreach um, right now. And it's been really great to see, you know, whole families come up to the table in the library, chat with Embry-Riddle students. Um, the, right now, our monthly theme is aviation. So 
the visitors in the public library have a chance to talk with real pilots, which is exciting for is exciting. little ones and also grandpas, you know, so we really see the whole spectrum as we push out in the public in that um, small capacity, keeping the um, event small and people coming to the table one by one. And then as we move hopefully into the fall when campus opens up again, um, I'm really hoping to expand the after school clubs here. Uh, again, reaching people in various ways, reaching out to all the different learners. I'm hoping to uh, expand off of our planetarium visits. So we have the Jim and Linda Lee planetarium here. After visitors see the show, I really want to create a space where the Embry-Riddle students represent whichever college they are a part of, aviation, engineering, global security systems, and, or mathematics and physics and life sciences. And the students will run, again, these interactive hands-on project-based opportunities for people to engage at another level, um, not just watch the show, but have this interactive component to really uh, solidify what they saw in another way after they are a visitor. Um, and then one more thing I hope to do in the fall, um, whether we're virtual or in person, in the past, Embry-Riddle has partnered with the um, Philharmonic Orchestra here and the Prescott Unified School District to make something called Constellations to Compositions. And so students, um, they created uh -oh. Kelly is looking so excited. She wants to be part of this. <laughs> I had to mute myself because I was, you know, making a weird noise. <laughs> All right. Yes, I'm excited. Go on. So they created um, songs with the help of their teachers in this type of thematic curriculum unit um, to go with the different constellations. And then, unfortunately, due to COVID, the, the end show never happened, but the planetarium had planned to sell tickets to all of the public and have the students' songs play in the background while the constellations pass. Oh, my planet. goodness. <laughs> Imagine if you brought a Lowell Observatory member to come be the keynote or like like a VIP yeah. event. Oh, my goodness. I love it. That's incredible. We have the Flagstaff Symphony Orchestra come and, and do some things with us sometimes, but it's never that cool. I'm going to have to I'm gonna have to get them going on that. Well, we can all be friends, Go so let's collaborate. <laughs> okay, so... We can collaborate together because at Chanchi Ranch, we have this massive property and we had a, an amphitheater and uh, we can bring Emory Riddle and NAU and we can have an orchestra and then we have the big sky. Oh, that my. Beautiful. Sounds like an incredible SciTech Festival event. <laughs> there you go. Dark sky, perfect stargazing. That's such you a heard it here first. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, let's call NASA. Let's, you know, get some cool people <laughs> to fly in and be like, oh, my goodness, the Arizona night sky. That's, I mean, what a great, that's why we want to do this show, right? Is, you know, we call it STEM Unplugged. And the idea is really to get people connected and, you know, think of think outside the box, right, Tom? No box required. And if we do work together, not only is it more fun, but imagine the reach that we would have, you know, connecting all of our networks together and really getting them excited about well, this. Well, Kelly, I think the other thing that you guys bring that's so important is we quite often forget the the emphasis or the impact that parents can have on this because the journey can be lonely if the youth, the, the child doesn't have support for this. And I think by offering SciTech events throughout the state, and they can be in Cottonwood or in Tubac, and they can go to events that big and small that the parents can go with them and they can see things and participate in things that they knew they're your youth were doing, but they didn't know much about it. And that being side by side doing that is even a greater emphasis for their well-being. Absolutely. And community identity too, of like right. really celebrating that, you know, all of you are up north and the idea of like northern Arizona, let's get out of let's get out of Phoenix for a little bit. But the idea of did you even know this existed in your backyard? And, you know, get out and explore Arizona. I think that's definitely one of the coolest part about living here now. You know, I, I love that I grew up on a farm in western New York, but there's something very special about Arizona and, you know, the groups and the organizations that collaborate here. It's it's exciting. So 
the whole reason I got into astronomy to begin with, I'm, I'm originally from Dallas, Texas, and there is no night sky in Dallas, Texas. It is, it is, there's nothing there, but uh, um, I really liked space and specifically I loved Pluto. I thought it was super mysterious and we didn't know anything about it. And I wanted to learn more. It wasn't until I moved to Flagstaff in 2014 that I even found out that Pluto was discovered at Lowell Observatory, like a hundred yards from where I'm sitting right now. You guys did the whole I Love Pluto event during. I thought that was the cutest because there were so many individuals that adore Pluto. And <laughs> like there's a whole subculture there around not only planets, but Pluto. I thought that was pretty neat that you guys put that together. <laughs> well, you know, we're getting close to the end of the show, but I definitely want to take, you know, time to really share with our listeners that we want to encourage you to get involved in your STEM community. Maybe you're an industry professional seeking ways to make an impact or a student searching for a mentor or a community collaborator like these three, hoping to meet the right people to help make it happen. So Kelly, what's one way or a few different ways that they could get in touch with you or Lowell Observatory? Um, so the best way is our website, lowell.edu. That's L-O-W-E-L-L. It's kind of a very fun word to say, it's but Lowell. Um, <laughs> but uh, we have all of our, our opportunities. We have our summer camps there. We have special programs for schools. Um, so if you're a teacher, we have um, virtual field trips right now. And hopefully in the future, whenever um, hopefully COVID is, is, no, is not as, as big, we get to have them back in person. And uh, kind of going back to those COVID adap uh, adaptions, we uh, are entirely outdoor this year. We're not going to have any indoor parts. Um, we've increased our sanitization efforts. We have limited capacity, which is a bummer for me because I don't get to see all of my kids, but safe. And then all of our staff will be fully vaccinated. Um, so, uh, uh, that being aside, uh, our website would be the best, the best way to get any uh, sort of information. And, um, we're always looking for, uh, um, those to help us out with any, uh, kids scholarships. Um, you can sponsor a kiddo, um, uh, uh, sponsor a couple kiddos and, um, again, all on our website and, uh, my information is also on our website. So, yeah. Well, thank you, Kelly. What about you, Tom? What are a few ways collaborators or um, supporters could get in contact with you? Um, not to complicate things, but all these things lead to the same place. But Pathways to Learning is probably the easiest to remember. But if you can't remember that, it's uh, Tonto Creek Camp. And the third is Chauncey Ranch. And any of those with a, a dot .com after them, with the exception of Pathway with the dot .org, will lead you to the website that will show you those various venues and the things that we're doing. Excellent. Thanks, Tom. What about you, Elise? Absolutely. Well, uh, Embry-Riddle STEM Outreach's website is the best place for uh, anyone interested to learn about what we're offering this summer and get a hold of my info as well. So that is prescott.erau.edu forward slash about forward slash STEM dash center. Um, there, there are links to the planetarium there as well. So you can um, join in on the YouTube live feeds that are still happening every month um, featuring that season's night sky. So learning about that. Um, there is info about our summer seminars, which is all virtual for now. And um, again, just good contact info for teachers or students or parents who are wanting to get, yeah, just jump, jumping into uh, what Embry-Riddle has to offer this summer. That's awesome. And, you know, as we go around one more time, just final thoughts or, you know, what do you personally, what, have you enjoyed being on the call? What are, you know, it's been a pleasure spending this time with you, but getting connected and collaborating. I, I saw the excitement when Elise was sharing and Kelly was excited, but this is really what it's all about. Do you have any final thoughts before we close the show, Kelly? I, um, I just really enjoy being uh, around people who, who kind of teach the same way that I do. It's uh, formal science or formal learning, but in a completely informal setting. And I think that's what makes it so exciting and so alluring is is that our philosophy of of learning is all about discovery it's it's child centered and and it's it's great to be around community members who who think the same way thanks kelly what about you tom i'm just going to leave it with an anecdotal story i'll, I'll never forget this 
So we do a lot of schools and we do them in the school season as in the school session season. And about two years ago, I was up at one of these outdoor learning platforms and the bus had arrived and the kids didn't want to go home only after three days. And he got up on the step of the bus and he looks back at me and he says, you know, yesterday was the best day of my life. And it was because that was a STEM camp. It opened his eyes. He, and I found out a little bit more about him, but he wasn't a great student, but he was in an environment that he could do what we said over and over on this call. He could experiment, he could fail and feel that he was a success. And that's what we're doing. That's incredible. I, that's, oh, yeah, I was, that's why people, do what we do, right? Really making those opportunities attainable. And, you know, I appreciate that story. Thanks, Tom. Elise, hard to follow, but any final thoughts? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, the the highlight for me was really seeing the similarities and the differences across the different um, organizations here. You know, I would say Tom represents sort of a life science um, perspective of things. Kelly is astronomy. We might be more engineering and aviation focused at Embry-Riddle, but to see, like Kelly said, how we all have sort of a similar approach to how we, we go about STEM outreach. And then as Tom said, you know, we all have this, I don't know, maybe that we're guided by this heartfelt vision to just promote STEM for the children of Arizona, because it really is just a, a avenue of limitless possibilities. It will open so many doors for their future, whether professionally or just as a way to be a critical thinker and a better, more well-rounded person. Um, I would say, at least for myself, I'm guided in my job by a real sense of, um, yeah, just <laughs> wanting to do what's good and, and open doors for young kids in Arizona. That's incredible. I agree. I'm right there with you. And, you know, Claire and I discussed about who do we invite and, you know, with the guidance of Karen from BRX, like really thinking about how do we structure the conversation, but allow for these moments. And I think that's the coolest part about what I've learned from hosting a show with Karen and, you know, inviting Claire now to be at SciTech Institute and really get to foster these collaborations. That's what we want to continue to do at SciTech. And we just truly appreciate all of you for being on the show with us tonight. And we'll, you know, like I said, share it out and Maybe we come back again in a few months and celebrate what happened. And maybe you present at our STEM Summit and say, we had this conversation and look, we're actually going to do that music event at Chauncey. I'm, we're doing it. I don't know if you guys are up, but you know, <laughs> I mark your calendar. <laughs> yeah, so down. Yeah, so in. All right, cool. Tom, we'll, we'll set the date so you can book the, book the uh, amphitheater. And we can ride horses at the same time. Oh so. my goodness. Now it's getting out of control. <laughs> well, we want to thank you for joining us for this episode of STEM Unplugged. STEM over the summer. We appreciate Kelly, Tom, and Elise for being on the show. If you would like more information, contact us at SciTechInstitute.org. This is your host, Kelly Green, and we would be glad to discuss how you can get connected. <music> <laughs>